Stirring in her sleep, she snuggled up closer, nuzzling her pillow. Her brittle pillow. Her hard, brittle pillow. Lexicon opened her eyes, and after only four seconds of her sleepy eyes staring through her glasses, still perked atop her snout directly into the empty sockets of a pale and strained pony skull in her forelimbs. Oso practically burst through the debris and even the wall, through century-old equipment with fire in his eyes, and his old pick-like weapons in his talons. At about the same moment, Kroos rushed in from further forward along the path, pistol drawn and leveled as both griffins scanned the cavern with piercing eyes, ready to utterly delete the offending party from existence. The skull rolled across the ground as Lexi continued to shriek, hidden behind Kroos. It wasn't until talons wrapped over her mouth and a paw kicked her in the back of her knees and forced her into a sitting position. Holy fuck, mud pony. If the capacity and potency of your lungs didn't downright amaze me, I would be dying of laughter. Well, at least after my ears stopped bleeding. Rose's tail twitched in aggravation, as did his eyes, as he refused to take his talons from her mouth. Oso sat down, sliding his weapons under his wings again. He appeared to be a griffin with impressive patience. But the way he rubbed the point where his beak ended and his feathery face began told her that this patience was stretching rather thin. Well, since you're up, get ready. And it looks like you're not crippled by all the strain yesterday, so pack your stuff. Lexi shook off Kroos' talons and whispered at him. It's not funny. She sat for a moment before Oso threw her bag down in front of her. Ready up, girl. We don't have forever. The big griffin turned away, as if he had everything better to do. With a great deal of mumbling and complaining, she packed everything, and with a little more help than she would like to admit, she was ready to go. The fringes of her mind told her that she was oblivious to them, and she did want to think about it. They would already be there if she wasn't with them, and they had to protect her life. Her freaking out and shrieking, while she personally felt she had been very valid reasons for doing so, they obviously did not have to forge a warpath, rushing in, ready to fight every time she saw something that scared her and made noise about it. Strapping the last of her clothes in place to keep out the frigid cold, she mumbled and winced as Oso pulled the straps on her back tight. Listen, Lexi. I know not being scared is not exactly a strong suit of yours, but I'm asking kindly to just toughen up a little. Your life might actually depend on it some day. We should at very least see one of the Susie today. Her culture has a practically religious, near biological opposition to weakness. The little pony opened her mouth and promptly closed it again. She didn't know what to do or say. She settled for trying to opt out. I don't suppose you guys can just leave me here somewhere while you do the meeting? It was sometimes a little hard to read the faces of a griffin, especially if they had no lips. But the corners of their mouths usually show their opinion and emotion. That would be a great way to get you killed even faster. There's not a single lump of flesh in all of the North that the Susie cannot find. Lexicon did not like the thought of being referred to as a lump of flesh, but the point got across easily enough. So, what's the plan? She raised her eyebrows, but had a good feeling that she didn't want to know the answer. He sighed, almost as if he was hating his own words. I have to give you a makeover. Lexi whimpered and Kroos groaned, clenching his talons harder, and dribbling blood onto the upturned and broken skull pulled from the ground. It was handy, a makeshift bowl. Oso's eyes remained very focused as he carefully spread the blood below Lexi's eyes. He had already tried bone fragments and tied them into her mane, and now he worked with very careful place to put fine, even blood streaks and marks over her face and neck. I don't bore your whole bullshit about your blood not being any good for this. Kroos was still very disgruntled as Oso explained that it had to be his blood and not any from the massive griffin. Sorry, 
but my blood might hurt her. He rubbed a swath of blood from under her eyes, streaking it down like bloody tears. How the fuck is that even a thing? What do you, <laughs> have some rust on your birdie harpoon? He smirked, and Lexi tilted her head a little, unsure of what Kroos was asking. Oso did not sound entertained. No, little one, I do not have STDs, but I do have a condition less embarrassing. But just as, if not more dangerous to her. Lexi opened her mouth, but Oso's talons clamped down softly, shutting it. And no, I'm not going to tell you. I'd rather keep that to myself. He popped another berry before reaching under his wing and plucking a feather. With a little bit of effort, he buried the long feather into her mane and tangled it up as to not let it fall out. Gross chuckled at the action, but mostly just remained quiet. Um, by any chance, could you at least explain what it is? She grumbled, still extremely uncomfortable using literal blood as face paint. It was almost too much for her as it was, but she needed to know more. The Susie have some cultural codes. Strength and combat prowess is extremely important, even among the children. However, there are few of their kind who simply can't fight. I forget the exact historical and cultural reasoning, but it's along the lines of, I cannot shed blood, so there are others who shed it for me, and my life lays in the efforts to support them. So, that's what the blood is for, and the hair... But the hair is more to let them realize you are female. They usually wear their hair a bit like this, and with those markings, they'll make it easier. She nodded, still not liking it at all. But it was better than dying to whoever those wolves would do. And the feather? Rose chuckled a little again. It was unclear if he knew or he just had a general guess. Oso shot him a glare and made the smaller griffin go quiet. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. It's not nothing. Come on, I know I'm not the most reliable for these situations, but I really need details to put myself at ease. It was almost reminding her of school. The other fillies always tried to keep things from her, or worse, gave her misinformation just to laugh at her. Look, these are all precautions. They might not be necessary. They thrive off being able to test their mettle. If they see all this, then they will, in all likeliness, attack me and Kroos first. I just want to be sure this goes smoothly, without you dying. Then can I go without the feather? She flicked what little mane she had loose, trying to keep the feather from annoying her. As soon as we are somewhere safe. He sighed and shot another glare at Kroos, who looked as if he was going to burst out from laughter. Can I tell her what it means in Griffin culture? He smiled and also growled under his breath. It basically means the same thing, just not as blatant. Now Lexi was very curious and Crow st stepped closer, still looking at Oso, giving him a look that just screamed that he was going to tell her the moment he turned his back. Oso groaned and with a loud sigh he opened his beak again. My feather in your mane, or decorating you where everyone can see it, implies sexual, or at the very least, romantic submissiveness to me. Lexi squinted, still expecting a little more of an explanation before Kroos spurted out. It means he's a pony fucker! He exploded into laughter, and Lexi went more rigid with embarrassment. Oso promptly conked Kroos over the head, shutting him up quickly. The wolves love their mates and family more than anything. They will even turn on their leaders instantly without a moment's hesitation if he or she harms or demands harm upon the family or lovers. Within the Susie, it is believed that love makes a warrior very powerful. As it is, they have a cultural taboo against killing their enemy's lovers when they can just fight their enemy. It seems kind of cowardly and dishonorable. Also, they would want to avoid sending their enemies into a bloody rage of vengeance. The feather combined with the markings. It's a certain way to make sure that they won't kill you when we aren't looking, or in the initial rush. In the end, it's not against their laws, but it's something that's frowned upon. Rose picked himself up at the ground, and despite the welt from the crown on his head, he was still chuckling. Oh, right. In here. He 
He stifled his laughter and held out the 10mm pistol to her. She was still overwhelmed and not sure how she would even pick up the pistol. Ah, uh, um, the, I, what? Oso's talons swiped over Kroos's open palm and snatched up the pistol. No, we are not giving her a weapon. I don't need her freaking out and shooting someone. Hell, she's most likely more dangerous to us than the wolves are. Fine, but I'm not letting you live this down. Kroos chuckled before Oso stepped past, nudging him hard enough to send him stumbling. Aye. Just remember that I'm five times your size, and I think we have already established how a fight between the two of us will go. He turned and began his way down the path through the cave. Lexi still sat there, wide eyes, looking very uncomfortably at the feather hanging from her hair. While Kroos didn't seem to mind the aggression from Oso, he had been trying to push his buttons for a while. He seemed more pleased that he finally got a reaction than fearful from the massive griffin. Just gave the warning. Instead of calling out or nudging her, Kroos opened his talons and gave a firm slap over Lexi's tush as he followed Oso. Come on, turkey concubine. We have some wolves to meet. The small, speechless pony had to force herself to practically stumble down the path after them. It was another few hours of walking before Lexi noticed snow on the ground mixed with icy deposits over the walls. Then, looking up, she was relieved to see the cloudy sky above them again, showering them with a fine, powdery snow through the small openings in the ceiling. Another thirty minutes before she felt comfortable saying that they were not technically in the cave anymore. She still flustered and worried over the feather in her mane. She could barely handle something so distracting, even if it did not have such a meaning. But she put some thought into it. If she was going to attack someone and noted something implying her target was in a relationship with some pony as intimidating as Oso was, she wouldn't even begin to think about going through with the attack. Lexi's train of thought was derailed as Oso gave a silent gesture and immediately Kroos took to the air. She entertained the idea of asking what was going on, but she was pretty sure at this point she sounded like a toddler asking questions every half second. These birds were warriors. Nothing about her and the way she thought was considered even remotely helpful to them in combat. She didn't know what they were doing, but if it was important, she didn't want to interrupt them or break the silence, especially with those two not speaking a word as they positioned themselves. The snow had significantly narrowed the channel they had taken to walk through. It was like some pony had shaved off the top of the cave and continued to make the road more and more shallow, set in the ground. Every step forward was like another layer of snow clinging to the walls. It made sense that the more exposure led to thicker snow, but the snow build up on the walls quickly revealed to have another purpose as the white flurry set of arms exploded outward from the snow and wrapped over Lexi. But before she could shriek out and possibly even deafen her assailant, Clawed fingertips covered her mouth firmly. To her terror, she could do nothing and didn't seem to realize that the large figure was simply holding her and nothing else. So, in its arms, she flailed and let out a muffled shriek and whimper. She fully expected crows, at the very least, to come charging. The moment her panic dropped just to low enough for her level of logical side to take over, her eyes darted around looking for the griffins. She quickly spotted Oso, trading titanic blows with the creature that stood head and shoulders above him, which was unthinkable with how massive he was, but she couldn't spot Kroos. She could only see what looked almost like wolves deeper in the woods, throwing rocks, but instead of rocks, fire and lightning shot up into the sky. Plowing into him, the heavy wolf roared and to Oso's face, who in turn let out a booming screech right back at the massive bipedaled wolf. It growled out while looking fiercely at Oso's eyes. Oso, in turn, clearly struggled and stumbled over some words, but managed to spit something out. The massive wolf seemed to regard him for a moment, letting go and stepping back, holding what looked like a small stone high. He gave it a noticeable squeeze and let it out a barely audible crackle. Near instantly, Lexi was released. She couldn't fathom what the device was, but logical Lexi mumbled something about wolves having better hearing and secret signals. Popping into the snow, she quickly scuttled back until she was practically under Oso, whimpering loudly within seconds. 
She looked back at the wolf who had held her, and to her surprise it looked rather feminine. It regarded her softly. Its movements was slow and fluid as it peered over her, and Lexi noticed its gaze was not her eyes, but to the left at the feather. The wolf raised its eyebrows, its eyes drifting from Oso to her and back. The fact that she was under him and cowering into his figure did not help with the awkwardness. Oso, can I take the feather out now? She blurted out, very uncomfortable, wanting dearly to move away from him, and at the same time not wanting to be more than a half inch from him. Sure, but keep it on you. It might come in handy later. He scooted the pony out from under him with his hind paw, almost as if she was just a stone he wanted out of his path. But just as quickly, he redirected his attention to the wolf directly in front of them. Is my comrade in the sky all right? The wolf looked over at him, and in a gruff voice, he grumbled back. Yes, he is fast. Our shamans could not pluck him from the sky, but they have tried. Lexi rested a little easier hearing that. She was not certain what he was saying, but she hoped he was, but she was confident enough that they were talking about Kroos. She quickly pulled the feather from her hair and stuffed it into one of her bags. The feminine-looking wolf chuckled and stepped back into a stray ray of light, peeking through the shadows in the rocky cliffs, but to her amazement the wolf seemed to utterly vanish the moment she touched the light. I assume you want to see the head oracle, yes? The beggar wolf before Oso grumbled. Yes, but I would like to wait for my comrade. Oso gestured to the sky with remarkable calmness, remarkable only to Lexi, who was only just barely not hyperventilating. She was confident that she would be fine, and though it was no real accomplishment to frighten her, she partially marveled at how calm and collected the big griffin was, especially after trading blows with the hulky beast of a wolf there with them. More wolves started to show up. Lexi found it rather frightening to see how fast they seemed to simply appear, almost as if they simply popped right up in front of her and out of thin air. They muttered and spoke to each other as they waited for Kroos to return. She had no idea what they were saying. Man, they seemed very on guard, speaking without inflections in their tone or facial twitches or any such tells. Even if she was good at reading faces, she would be utterly lost. Watching Oso's features, she was something similar to relieved to see that she could read his face. And she was not the only one lost. If she had a guest, he was not suspicious or wary, but completely lost in the speech. She would watch him listening intently, but she would watch him seemingly phase out, then snap too. She didn't know much about reading people, but she knew languages. He was trying to listen, and it was clear that he did not know the language fully, and he would be lost in the genuine, gentle splashes of words and rumblings like a small guttural ocean. Then she noticed something. She couldn't be positive, but the way the wolves were speaking was almost like it was two separate languages. One was much longer and spoken more artistically. The other seemed to flow out like a blazing fire. Lexi swatted herself. She was putting way too much thought into something so unimportant. She grumbled and fidgeted before she noticed some of the more feminine wolves giggling and chuckling softly at her. She felt very uncomfortable, especially having that feather in her bags. She could still feel the spot where it was attached to her mane. Her mind began to fuss again, before the wolves noticeably became more active, and just as fast, Kroos landed in the clearing, fuming angrily as he leaned in closer to Oso and spouted off, You didn't say I'd be dodging fucking lightning and fire! Oso raised a set of talons calmly. I told you what you needed to know. A shot that I will hear and never see. Just run and turn quickly at random. His jaw was so tight, his beak was making audible noises from the stress. Yes, but you are alive. Congrats. You followed the instructions and you weren't killed. These wolves may not be able to fly, but make no mistakes. They own the skies. They own all of the north. He smiled and gave a firm pat on Kroos's head. Kroos looked to be just about done with it all. Kroos? Lexi's tone was calm, but she had a feeling that while he was very angry about the situation, he had followed her of his own accord. Honestly, she was extremely surprised that he was still with them. His oath, contract, or whatever it was, must have been extremely important. 
Rose looked back at her, and relief flooded through her, as he didn't even look back at Oso. He just made his way to her side and stood silently. He was young, but he seemed like a model soldier, and just as concerned about the wolves as Lexi was. Aye, now you are all prepared. Let's go. The Oracle is surely waiting for us all. The wolf smiled and turned about. Lexi picked up a beep and checked it. Confused, she watched the Pipbuck spew out lines of words. Mission with the Big Bird. Find the Wolves, Part 3. Go see the Oracle. She whispered to the Vice with a great deal of frustration. I hate you. Why can't you just make logical sense? But it was at this time that she noticed a small red bar indicating that she had a bit of radiation buildup. Almost panicking, she rifled through her things and sipped quickly on the bag of fluids. Checking and rechecking every few moments, and only began to relax when she saw the levels began to drop. Luckily, it had not been very high. But she saw what radiation did to the wildlife, and she'd received some training about radiation back before the world ended. She did not want to start mutating. Now calmer, and with Kroos following close, watching the wolves like he knew for a fact they would turn on them all at a moment, they shuffled through the snow along the seemingly barely existing path with surprising ease. The wolves led the small group along as they made their way. The snow became deeper and deeper, but thankfully Oso was walking in front of Lexi. Even taking in his massive size, he was irregularly powerful, and seemed to be taking no effort to plow through the snow and ice, creating a path for those who followed. The more she traveled, the more she became to notice that more and more wolves were beginning to show up. They even took up residence in the dead, frozen trees before seeming to vanish as she blinked. Lexi stirred, wanting to ask questions, but her logical mind whispered to her. Oso still looked very stressed. Kroos was still very angry, and at the less-than-logical Lexi wailed into her ears that wolves were scary. And so it was. She quietly walked the path, being carved through the deep snow until she saw it. Whoa, well, was all she could say. She'd seen pictures of the large, plain wood wall filled with run-down huts, filled with yaks and the ritualistic smashing of various objects. This was nothing like that. These walls had risen another forty feet, and what looked like giant dragon bones reinforced the walls. Massive crystals held in place by ruined bindings, and much to her displeasure, the walls appeared to be very thoroughly decorated with yak bones. Other than that, there was what she guessed to be a large tree, with deep blood-red leaves just barely peeking over the tops of the walls. The village was once called yak Yakistan, was now a fortress that utterly dominated the landscape. Yeah, that was my first reaction, too. Oh, so slowed. He breathed deeply and grumbled, Reaching back, he picked Lexi up with a single outstretched grasp. She let out a sharp eep, but he ignored her as he looked directly at Kroos. Don't touch the red tree. It is sacred to them, and they will kill you instantly. He hefted her and climbed over the snow, setting her down. As she sank halfway into the snow, she came to the conclusion that while it was quite useful to have some pony that strong around to just pick her up willy-nilly, she kind of hated her. She had been completely at the mercy of literally everything in this land since she'd woken up. Getting manhandled by a griffin ten times her size was just rubbing in her weakness, making her feel slightly smaller. Speaking of making me feel small, she muttered as they approached a massive gate. Two things caught her eyes. The first made very little sense at all, and the second made her blurt out something she hoped she would not be taken the wrong way by the wolves. She quickly noticed the massive dragon-like bones supporting the walls it looked quite literally metal. She guessed by the level of oxidation that it was raw iron. Then there was something that she could not quite ignore. Being a pony, naturally, she had not been very keen on eating other animals, and thus she was quite put off by the massive multi-wheeled cart, hauling in what she could only be guessed was a skinned and gutted monster from the wastes. She recoiled from the sight, but something caught her eyes. The cart itself was very old and extremely well-crafted, with fine, hardened wood that appeared to be extremely durable, even without treatments. The wood had various treatments, but 
She could plainly see from the great deal of other objects lying around, the heads of the spears and the other bladed weapons from which the wolves were pushing and pulling the massive cart had an abundance. The level of technology was more extensive than this. They likely had, at the very least, steel ball-bearing axles and reinforced joints for something like this, even without a factory in sight. But at a quick glance as they passed, she could see a heavy friction burns where the axle met the wheel. Hey, this thing needs lubrication. If it continues like this, the axle will fracture. She gestured lightly at the wheel in need. The wolves slowly, uh, quickly, taking note of her words. Her heart sank. Other than the few wolves that had met them and the few still there with them, she hadn't heard many speak at all. Not to mention, despite there being a team of about twenty wolves, other than the grunts and growls, they'd been very silent. She just hoped they wouldn't see her as a nosy pony telling them what to do. One wolf made his way over. She took in his oddly fluid-like movements. He was covered in scars and appeared to have a fine limp, but oddly his head stayed perfectly level and did not bob or stagger at all. His stature was nothing like what she would expect from his appearance. Thank you, pony. Even his voice took her off guard. Equestrian was clearly not his first language, but he spoke it remarkably well. She half expected some sort of shrill, guttural growling and mumbling, but despite his looks, the wolf practically spoke like a poet, with a deeper and somewhat mysterious voice. Y you're welcome? I mean, I don't know your supply situation, but I would recommend a synthetic oil. But a simple upgrade to the axle would do best for the cart. No, we can just use some lard. He smiled keenly at the next wheel. Thank you, though. I can forget to service my cart sometimes. She stared with wide eyes as the wolf grabbed and exposed a hunk of fat hanging off the dead creature and the cart, and began to liberally apply it to the axle. Ross nudged her, and she continued forward, and she moved, trying to get back up close to Oso. Again, she recalled to the sight, and even the thought. Not only did these wolves eat meat and decorate their walls with bones, they'd use the fat of their enemies to lubricate their machines. She found it oddly terrifying that they could do all this and still speak so civilized. Moving past the gate, she gasped at the massive size of the tree, which she quickly noted was entirely blood-red. It was not just leaves, but it was red bark, and red everything. She quickly noted that it appeared to have been magically grown. She remembered her science class growing watermelon into odd shapes by restricting the growth of fruit inside a shaped container. But this tree had dozens upon dozens of flawlessly squared petals that had been grown in a perfect right angles, horizontal from the trunk. Evenly spaced on top were many wolves, old, young, and very young. They all stood, eyes closed, and a vague chant coming off their lips as they seemed to whisper softly. It was like a sweet and sad song as they all remained silent, perfectly in sync with another. Other than the soft chant, the city was eerily silent. The wolves went about their daily lives without a word. Even the little market she could see in the distance was being shopped at. No words. A wolf just walked, pointed, then the other wolf handed her what looked to be a wrapped basket. The wolf then dropped something on the table and they parted. It baffled her. But she thought for a few seconds and decided that it wasn't too odd. She was born and raised in Equestria. She couldn't go outside without hearing, at least... Ten ponies talking in the streets on a busy day, they might even break into song. With how silent the wolves were, perhaps their cultures were simply not one for small talk or any talk. Suddenly there was a sound she knew by heart. Laughter. The laughter of children. She watched the little wolf pups rush through. Despite their large teeth, she couldn't help but look at them with a smile. They were so adorable. She took a moment with an observation that made them even cuter. From the looks of them, they guessed they grew into their tails. The adults and children basically had the same sized tails, and looking at them scamper about those large fluffy tails almost made her want to try and pet one. But then there was something that made her heart sink. As the children ran past, she watched the colors of their coats, with ranging from black to white to mostly browns, dark grays, and a very rarely pure white. But she spotted eyes among the small group, staring longingly at the other pups. 
The children themselves do not seem to even notice the pony and griffins, but those eyes froze on her. She looked closely and noticed the cold, fear-stricken eyes. Three of them. Solid black fur from two young pumps. But to her horror, they were horribly scarred. Not much so, that one was even missing his eye. She could see by the little paw it raised that it was missing two digits as well as it looked at her with mistrust and fright. She didn't know this culture, but she did not know how it would be taken if she questioned why the pure black furred ones looked so abused and didn't mix well with the other ones, more diversely furred pups. The little pup uttered some words and the other repeated it. The words drove a cold shock through her, and she felt extremely uncomfortable, even fearful that the little ones foreign words. She simply stared uncomfortably, but a pure white wolf moved forward, ushering them off, speaking too soft to hear them. But they could not look away. All three eyes from both pups were glued to her till they had fully passed through a door and out of sight. Uh, Oso? What's that mean? She swallowed, very put off by the event. She couldn't even repeat the complicated words the pups had uttered if she wanted to. I have to be honest, little one. I have no idea. I learned their language just barely. But then they came along with some whole other dialect which I barely learned. I think they managed the island tribe into the main tribe. I really don't know. He didn't bother looking back. He just sighed and continued forward. Sorry. I'm just not used to having to explain and babysit ponies through this god's awful land. She nodded and clamped her lips shut, only glancing back at Kroos for a moment. She felt a little upset as he looked relieved that she had made the display of being quiet. Grumbling, but not actually speaking, she followed Oso, who seemed to be following the wolf who had led them to the city, and Kroos followed her. All the other wolves had appeared to be simply peeling off or vanishing as they made their way forward. They closed in on the base of the tree, where she took note of even more bones. A large, high-ceiling building made of wood and more bones stood firmly, yet the doorway was constructed of chiseled stone and wide open, veiled only by what she in her near terror identified as what was most likely yelp, yak pelts. Something inside her spoke loudly, and she found herself not wanting to go close to the building. But as she was clearly not the decider of her own fate, she reluctantly followed Oso, and did her best to move fast enough for Kroos to not bump into her. She was quite thankful to a wolf on the inside pulling back the pelts. They entered calmly, and Oso looked to be about ready to give some sort of ritualistic greeting as he bowed low. But something odd happened. A wolf, pure white, with a very feminine figure, hopped off the throne and made of carved and ruined bones. Very unlike the wolves in the city, this one hopped right up to Oso and oddly hugged him. It appeared uh, to take the big bird by surprise, too. In fact, he looked very uncomfortable. Oh, you do care. You came after all. You didn't bring the grump. But who is this? This is not Tyron. This is not Earl. Or Yin. Did you make new friends? He moved closer looking and even sniffing at Kroos, who let out a grumble, trying not to look like he was not trying to lean away from her. She quickly moved on, and again Lexi did not know what to do, as the wolfess was almost immediately in her face, with deep blue eyes that were so beautiful it almost hurt to look at them. Um, hi? I, um, you see, I'm, uh... Lexi fumbled with her words as the wolf circled her, smelling and sniffing, even poking. Books. Diminished physique. Discomfort. Oh, so. You left the group, and the grump, and the scholar behind, but you still brought a grump and a scholar. She laughed and made her way back, seeming to almost throw herself into the large stone chair. I was expecting Elder Oracle Kulmia... Kuhana. Oso rubbed the bridge of his nose. Lexi could tell that at the moment, these actions were more annoying than her presence, at least for the moment. Lexi could happily settle for being second worst on her friend's nerves. Sadly, it was her time. 
Mother went to join the Great Hall. You should have seen how many cursed blood she killed before she finally felled. We are still celebrating. Also looked left, then right, seeing the stoic honor guard standing firm as the wolf is corrected. Well, I am still celebrating. What is the point in life if you can't be happy? And a leader must be happy. Happy for the people. It is my place. Grumbling quietly, Oso took a moment, then spoke softly. Very well then, Elder Rusu. We are here to try, again, to barter for your assistance in the... He paused, looking back at Kroos and Lexti before sighing. The project. A look of disdain and annoyance spread over her face. It was as if any indication of his previous experiences... This would take a long time. No, you have our assistance. And please, call me Rosie. She chimed happily as she leaned in on her throne. How about n- And wait, what? Osa's eyes went wide and Lexi could have swore she heard him squawk. D- Don't take my confusion for disappointment, but- Um- what makes today any different from the last, I don't know, fifty times? The white wolf called Rosie smiled, and with a single playful motion she levied a pointed finger at Lexi. Because of her. Footnote. No level up. While your companions do most of the heavy lifting, you are doing quests. You could certainly do more.